like to thank Reverend Regal for the invitation to address the Grosse Point Unitarian Church. It's a pleasure and honor to speak here. I'll, f I'll first outline in brief the experiment of the Charles Street Meeting House in Boston from 1949 to about 1960 and sketch a little how it looks now given the life of our country and culture during the intervening 55 years or so and then suggest the value of the experiment might still hold for us today. In 1964, Beacon Press and Meeting House Press published Kenneth L. Patton's book, A Religion for One World, Art and Symbols for a Universal Religion. Patton presents what he calls the history of the experiment of the Universalist Charles Street Meeting House uh, at the foot of Beacon Hill in Boston. The photo sh showing uh, its original design of 1807. He highlights the various viewpoints already existing then within the Unitarian Universalist traditions, as in Brainerd F. Gibbons' call in 1949 for, quote, a unifying universal religion, end quote, and others who preferred maintaining their fellowship in affiliations in Christendom. Patton defined the debates as it will be a world religion or the liberal wing of Christianity. He and other universalists wanted to embrace what is universal in all the great traditions and religions, including Buddhist, Hindu, Taoist, Shinto, and so on. In pursuit of such a universal religion, Patton and his colleagues understood their experiment as extending the historic mission of universalism in affirmation of uh, universal salvation. By analogy with the political world, they saw themselves as attempting to create a parallel to the United Nations and in the hopes it represented in the late 50s and early 1960s one world, one humanity, one universal religion. Patton and his supporters approached the Massachusetts Universalist Convention for help in establishing the Charles uh, Street Meeting House in the, in the historic district of Boston at a time when 22 churches had recently died out that were all universalist churches all around Boston, and uh, all of which were traditional Christian churches in form. He reports that many Universalist churches were exceedingly reluctant participants and supporters. Nevertheless, over five years, uh, support was cultivated, and the experiment uh, lasted for about 10 years carried along mostly by the dedicated few. Leaving aside Patton's nearly 500-page book, discussing the background and experience of the project in detail, I think the photographs of the interior of the church convey much of the impulse and thinking behind its founding. The, the seating was arranged in a circle, thought of as more inclusive, instead of the traditional way of facing an altar podium. On one end was a, a large mural of the great nebula in Andromeda, as in the photo, suggestive of the cosmic scope and perspective of the church, while on the floor was a map of the entire world as a centerpiece. On the opposite end of the rectangular building, in, uh, interior of the building, was the chosen symbol for a universal church, a golden circle representing unity, eternity, holiness, wholeness, as well as the sun, moon, and earth, and so on, meant to resonate with the use of a symbolic circle in most of the religious traditions around the world. In an appendix to the book, there is a large annotated collection 
of traditional religious symbols and artworks uh, from around the world uh, reflected on the, the beautiful screen you have back here historically. Um, a number of symbols found their way, remarkably. Many in some form of a circle. His chapters discussing the intimate connection of the arts with spirituality are quite insightful and profound, as are his reflections on the searing winds of modernity drying up the day springs of the spiritual. To look farther back for context, from a longer historical experience, the early and highly influential Unitarian minister William Ellery Channing, sermon of 1828, Likeness Unto God, still provides today a relevant text for reflection and understanding, harmonizing in many ways with Patton's experiment. Channing wrote, quote, we approach and resemble the mind of God. We are brought into harmony with creation. God unfolds himself and his works of nature to a kindred mind. We discern more and more of God in everything from the frail flower to the everlasting stars. The idea of God is the idea of our own spiritual nature purified and enlarged to infinity. We see God around us because he dwells within us. Like Patton, indeed, sensible religion East and West, Channing advocates that to grow in the likeness of God, we need not cease to be men, women as well, I'd say, for our time. Uh, not a mysticism that detaches and isolates, but one that connects and harmonizes the fire and natural unfolding of our highest powers of understanding and conscience love. These excerpts constitute a fair epitome of Channing's thinking. Emerson, George Ripley, another prominent early Unitarian minister, and Henry David Thoreau all thought highly of Channing as did many of uh, the, the later so-called transcendentalist writers and so forth, even as they evolved beyond him to the extent that the spirituality that Channing represented has been swept aside by an intolerant modern secularism, if not nihilism, lost, traded, devolved into less exalted conceptions of the human being, all the worse for our time. Much of the social dis deterioration and stresses we suffer are from the lack of a unifying spiritual understanding of life that harmonizes the best of past experience with current times. The choice of much of modernity to interpret life in extremely secular terms has taken humanity out of harmony with its own history and past and is at the root of many of our continuing problems on this planet. In many ways, Modernity has made the wrong choice. That we have thrown out the baby with the bathwater becomes ever more clear. More than enough historical experience has been suffered to prove its inadequacy. More hyper-rationalism, materialism, even various kinds of tyranny some seem to be flirting with in our culture and around the world are the wrong elixir to heal the wound. We're sinking under the weight and confusion of dehumanizing mechanical and formalistic ideas and abstractions when what we need is experience and a moderate universal reinterpretation and affirmation of the spiritual oneness of human beings and the great religions and cultures at the deepest levels of mystical experience and consciousness. That is not to advocate any backward movement or return to any traditional exclusivism. Such recognition of the universality of world religion, 
could provide more of a stabilizing tradition for America and the world, much more than dominant relativism, which often leaves the social space vulnerable and undefended from extremists of every stripe, including secular. The liberal Unitarian Universalist tradition, unlike any other, runs very long and deep into American history and culture and has repeatedly demonstrated its capacity for change when needed. Much of my life has been given to the study of uh, its impact on the literature and poetry of Ralph Waldo Emerson and the trans Transcendentalists. As early as the 1820s, Unitarian missionaries in Kolkata, India, had extensive contacts with such Indian liberals as Ram Mohan Roy, the Tagore family, and others who were striving to find and create a universal interpretation of Indian spirituality, running all the way forward to the 1893 Parliament of World Religions in Chicago even into the 20th century. All of which I've written about in my book, The Myth of the Enlightenment. Growing up in a family of several Christian denominations, both Catholic and Protestant, I repeatedly had the experience of family holidays, of fierce arguments into which my mother would step shouting, enough, we're here to celebrate the holiday together. Let us celebrate life together. Truth is one, sages call it by many names. A high school class in world religions in the early 1970s inspired my lifelong interest in religion, which I pursued through independent study, university coursework, and a number of traditions, as well as teaching world religions at the college level in literature and so on. For more than a decade, I have visited over 60 churches, mosques, synagogues, UU churches, Jain and Hindu temples, Sikh Gudwaras, Buddha Sanghas, and other houses of worship through my own inner urging and with the Troy area interfaith group. Far from the conventional sense of traditional religion, we human beings need to recognize more the unity all spiritual traditions at the deepest level. The modern effort seeking universality reaches throughout the Unitarian Universalist tradition and far beyond them. It is the longing of the human heart for its deepest intimations of consciousness and being far from the exclusivisms of the past or the exclusivism of scientism and the enlightenment ideology, universality is ever more the experience of our daily lives. Even as retrograde forces in every culture around the world attempt to turn backwards to orthodoxies and theocracies that seek to dominate entire cultures, and control every minute aspect of the individual's life. All the more reason that a reassessment of the cultural landscape we homo sapiens on this planet have created since Patton's time is needed and a reaffirmation of universality. The great mystics of all traditions, Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, etc., emphasized that religion was not merely a building, a creed, an organization, or a social group, but an experience in the innermost heart and soul of the individual, where the peace that passeth understanding truly resides, and which provides upon return to the ordinary daily life the motivating energy for a meaningful life, social justice, and brotherly love and peace. 
In all traditions, those who are gifted in creating a nurturing community life, I think, can co continue as they choose, finding, I believe, instead of graying out, or worse, falling into fanaticism, the masses would pour back in through the front door, now able to understand spirituality in the widest and deepest sense in a moderate, peaceful, in moderate, peaceful harmony with the fullness of modern life. To a considerable degree, much of Patton's experiment has been absorbed into the Unitarian Universalist Church and others, as the general culture to varying degrees has opened through the decades more to Eastern and global influences in its own way. Uh, to save ourselves from the crises that confront us, I believe we human beings must recover the universality of the spiritual and the sacred. One of the clearest expressions of the nature of universality was vo voiced by the American Indian Ohiyasa, also known as Charles Alexander Eastman Asante Sioux, uh, in his books at the very beginning of the 20th century. I will read a few short, brief, beautiful, sensitive selections from Kent Nearburn's 1999 collection titled the wisdom of the Native Americans. Many other indigenous peoples have a very similar understanding of life that also harmonizes with the science of quantum physics, its implications as attested to by many of its leading scientists over the, the decades. Quote, Ohiyasa, the attitude of the American Indian toward the eternal, the great mystery that surrounds and embraces us is as simple as it is exalted. To us, it is the supreme conception, bringing with it the fullest measure of joy and satisfaction possible in this life. The worship of the great mystery is silent, solitary, free from all self-seeking. It is silent because all speech of necessity is feeble and imperfect. Therefore, the souls of our ancestors ascended to God in wordless adoration. It is solitary because we believe that God is nearer to us in solitude and there are no priests authorized to come between us and our maker. None can exhort or confess or in any way meddle with the religious experience of another. All of us are created children of God and all stand erect, conscious of our divinity. Our faith cannot be formulated in creeds nor forced upon any who are unwilling to receive it. Hence, there is no preaching, proselytizing, nor persecution, neither are there any scoffers or atheists. Ohiyasa continues, our religion is an attitude of mind, not a dogma. There are no temples or shrines among us save those of nature. If you ask, what is silence? We will answer, it is the great mystery. The holy silence is the voice of God. If you ask us, what are the fruits of silence? We will answer, they are self-control, true courage or endurance, patience, dignity, reverence. Silence is the cornerstone of character. Chief Joseph of the Ness Pierce wisely observed, quoted in the same book, quote, we do not want churches because they will teach us to quarrel about God, as the Catholics and Protestants do. We do not want to learn that. We, want, we may quarrel with men sometimes about things on this earth, but we never quarrel about God. We do not want to learn that. <laughs> 
Finally, I'd like to share with you the beautiful reflections of a short prayer from Black Elk. Uh, a, Lakota, a Lakota Sioux, suggestive of who we are and what we need, now all the more as a world culture to recover from our journey through modernity, let's call it. <laughs> Quote, Black Elk. Grandfather, great spirit, once more behold me on earth and lean to hear my feeble voice. You live first and you are older than all need, older than all prayer. All things belong to you, the two-legged, the four-legged, the wings of the air, and all green things that live. You have set the powers of the four quarters of the earth to cross each other. You have made me cross the good road and the road of difficulties. And where they cross, the place is holy. Day in, day out, forevermore, you are the life of things. <laughs> 